Dr. Claire Pomeroy. Scheduled for today's live presentation has this ending at 9.30 a.m. Attendees can earn one contact hour for the keynote portion of this session. The Zoom platform that we're using today to bring us all virtually into my living room uh, has a chat feature. Please use that chat window to exchange ideas, provide resources and links to sites related to, to the session's topic. It's a great place to network with your colleagues and bounce ideas off each other in real time. Each of you has the ability to actually save the chat exchange at the end. You do this by clicking on the chat icon and then on the bottom right hand corner, click on those ellipses. There you'll see an option to save the chat in your desktop. This way, if others share links, websites or resources, you have that copy saved for after. And coming up soon, you should see some interactive polls popping up on your Zoom screen. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Pomeroy, will be talking about the results of the polls, the results that you're giving. So we'd love for you to take a few moments to answer those four poll questions as they pop up. And as always, we know you will, but a reminder, be professional, be kind, and try not to use this platform for solicitation or recruitment purposes. Uh, inappropriate behavior may result and you being removed from this and future presentations. As you may notice, we are recording this presentation. Please mute your phone lines to minimize background or unexpected noise. And during the webinar, you can try a few different ways of viewing the presentations. We encourage you to try the gallery view and compare it to speaker view. You've got a lot of choices here on the Zoom platform. Uh, for the formal presentation time, we ask that you turn off your cameras. Usually it's silence your cell phone. Now it's also turn off your cameras. Very on brand for 2020. This will allow us to uh, maintain our attention on the speaker screen. It will also increase the speed of your bandwidth. And then once we open up the Q&A, uh, this is a great time to turn your camera back on. You should be seeing those poll questions pop up. And I can see that you are because we're seeing results come in. Now, let's get to our presentation. Our keynote speaker received a Bachelor of Science degree from California State Northridge and obtained his physical therapy certification from a combined program at CSUN and UCLA. He went on to receive a master's degree in exercise science from CSUN and his DPT from the EIM Institute. He's worked as a physical therapist in a hospital setting, skilled nursing, home health, and private practice. He currently serves as the president of the CPTA. On a national level, he has served as a chapter delegate over 20 times, serves in the private practice section's payment policy committee, and is a member of APTA's Alternative Payment Model Task Force. He is the recipient of CPTA's James McKillop Leadership Award, the Clarence Holtgren Service Award, and the Charles Magistro Service Award. He works for Spine and Sport Physical Therapy as their VP of Development and continues as a faculty member at CSUN School of Physical Therapy and also maintains a role as an expert consultant for the Physical Therapy Board of California. It is our pleasure to introduce Rick Katz to the program. Rick, welcome. Thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate the, the intro and uh, having you here to, to kick us off. It's, it's Nice way to wake up everybody on a Saturday morning. I really appreciate it. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm gonna do a little share screen here so you can kind of follow along with me and get this up and running. Uh, and there we go. Well, uh, it's, it's kind of strange to, to have interaction with all of you in this manner. It's a little different for me. I, I really miss the face-to-face, the one-on-one -face, the -on -one interaction. Uh, but appreciate the opportunity to still be able to to uh, talk with you and to be in front of you. Um, so back in 1977, uh, my life revolved around preparing for PT school and, and running what appears here as an orthopedic traction business at 12 LA hospitals. This is one of the tractions I'd set up. I, I had to learn about vectors, force couples, traction, counter traction, and the foundations of my interest in running my own business started way back then. Uh, since then, although I have been employed by many companies along the way, I've never been without a side business or opportunity in the field of physical therapy. And this year, one of the challenges we faced was that we had, had to make efforts to preserve yeah, our ability to be independent contractors. You gotta talk with Brian Broderson. We have Trump some uh, background noise. Who's okay, this interesting name? Themselves. I, I've met Brian a couple times. Ladies and gents, if we could ask you to mute your microphones during the presentations. Mute your microphones, please. Thank you. So has life changed to the point that lessons learned way back in 1977 no longer apply today? I realize a lot of you on the phone weren't even born in 1977. So 
Um, I, I thought that my work in life was really complex back then, trying to run a business and applying for PT school. And now the skills of being creative and responsive to change are really testing all of us in this current environment. Determining vectors and angles has led to trying to determine how to respond to some of the biggest challenges we have ever faced. Those vectors and angles have now turned into these kind of vectors and angles, trying to figure out how to go the right way down a, a grocery store aisle or how to keep six feet away. So I guess those skills that I learned way back then have really, really transferred well into, into current life. And then comes 2020. Time has provided the lessons on knowing how to adapt to change. It has provided the satisfaction of knowing that we as PTs and PT assistants will always be essential workers in enhancing the health of society. We were really off to a good start this year. We started off at our CSM in Denver. It was filled with excitement for me. I have been a member of the APTA, CPTA for over 40 years. I had a vision of where I thought our profession should go. We started the year with a strong foundation and a history was created by our past presidents and past staff. They laid a great foundation for us to go into a year of challenge. I thank every one of them for what they have done. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, we started with the, the year with a packed agenda. We were engrossed in responding to members' inquiries that impacted their patients and them personally on a financial and health level to the normal business of the state. And, but the normal business of the state actually continued on. We had an agenda that we wanted to follow. It included the items up on here. I'll go into a little bit more detail on some of these later on, but we had athletic trainer bills interstate compact bill. We had reform to the independent contractor relationship. We were assisting in the animal rehab area. We had follow up on our workers' comp legislation that we successfully passed last year. We thankfully upgraded the infrastructure of the, the IT in our office, which has kind of worked out well for us this year. Uh, we had the planning for our Rose Parade uh, and Centennial planning. And we have a, a new committee on the board, which yeah. was uh, which actually had a lot of work this year in the Diversity Affairs Committee. We started off with the um, PT Legislative Day. That was extremely successful with over 225 members showing up. That was actually considered, I think, the last uh, gathering of professionals in the Capitol before they, they shut it down. It was actually the last time that I traveled until I came up here uh, two days ago. So what happened? Things got a little squirrely. The road got a little bit rougher. What did we do as a chapter? Well, there was a national push to allow greater access to telehealth. We contacted the governor's office along with many other professions to request that all payers authorize telehealth services for payment. Actually, the next day after we sent that letter in, we got a notice from the governor's office that he decided to go ahead and make it uh, universal that, that PT had to be paid uh, at the same level as, um, as other, as in, in house or in face, uh, in person treatment. Uh, and that would last through the federal emergency. There was actually a law, a parity law that was passed previously that was not supposed to go into effect until next year. But because of the emergency, the, the governor moved it up. And also we were contacted by some insurance companies to ask us what they should pay for when it comes to, to telehealth. Should they be paying for the same procedures? We thought because of our relationships with these payers that it was pretty nice that they actually reached out to us. That's fairly unusual. Then later in March, Stacy Defoe, our executive director and myself, we, we were on a call with the Governor's Healthcare Coalition to uh, assist with organizing the workers' response to the COVID-19 crisis. We actually created a survey to members and we had over 2,500 responses from our membership to show their willingness to participate in assisting with healthcare delivery in the, in the acute setting. Uh, we had a discussion with the California Hospital Association regarding the workforce support, which they greatly appreciated. So it allowed us to develop a, a stronger coalition and relationship uh, with the California Hospital Association. And results from our survey were actually shared with them. We then had a little hiccup in the coverage for the, the telehealth with some of the counties and contacted the governor's office 
to make sure that they were authorizing coverage for children, for new, newborn to three-year-olds in the county systems. And within the same day, the governor's office corrected that. So our relationships that we established over the years started really paying off for us during this crisis. We had contact with the Department of Consumer Affairs regarding waivers for student supervision and, and how it worked with the implementation of telehealth. And we had a call between uh, the executive director of the PT Board of California and the, the heads of the education programs in California regarding licensure continuation waivers. We then had continued discussions with the California Medical Association and the Department of Consumer Affairs regarding a waiver uh, regarding the, the in-office uh, requirement for the direct access um, uh, authorization. So when somebody completes their 12 visits or 45 days, it required an in-office visit to, to authorize the plan of care. And we were successful in moving that forward via a telehealth mechanism. Uh, we also interacted quite a bit with uh, Governor Newsom, uh, to, who had a proposal in his budget to eliminate optional services, which included physical therapy under Medi-Cal. And that work had to involve interaction with the, the Senate and the Assembly to move forward their budget, which allowed for inclusion of those services. So this was one of our earliest challenges with the pandemic. And as an association, we were challenged by members and non-members who actually urged us to make a determination of whether they, as a PT, should continue to treat patients. Our message was clear. And then as a doctoring profession, it should be a decision made between you and your patient. We took this challenge on and responded individually with phone calls to the members that had concerns. And we worked through this. And obviously at the end, we all know how essential we are in, in terms of treatment uh, during the pandemic and be following the pandemic. Hopefully we'll get to the following part soon. Um, very early on in the process, we developed a resource page on our website that dealt with many of the aspects of the pandemic and including protecting clinicians and their patients, uh, HR issues, connecting page, uh, individuals to PPE resources, SBA loans, and uh, other websites that were crucial. I participated in a weekly chapters president meeting that happened every Monday at five o'clock. It was a three hour call that we can join. And there was a lot of sharing. First, it was kind of a, just a support group. In the end, it turned out to be a very vital form of communication between all of the, the chapter leadership uh, throughout the country. And uh, what I have found is that we were tapping into each other's resources and we as a chapter, got so many thank yous from the other components uh, regarding our resources page and they have how they wanted to access the information that we had put together. So why create the wheel? So the work of your staff uh, and, and also board members really paid off for the benefit of the entire country. Uh, we then had our virtual house of delegates and that was really an eye opening experience for all of us. It was a greater strain, I think, on the larger chapters had developed ways of communicating among their own delegates and along with communicating with house officers and other, and other uh, delegates. And uh, in the end, it turned out to be a pretty remarkable experience for us. Uh, I, I do know that our delegation really missed our personal interactions that occur socially and occur on side conversations, but we seem to work through that. And under the leadership of our chief delegate, Michael Simpson, we were really an effective, productive uh, delegation and continue to retain our high profile with house business. As you can imagine, the discussion around diversity, equity, and inclusion became a real focus this year. Your chapter had just established a diversity affairs committee, which really took on the challenge of responding to members. We had the first of a series of town halls that were held a couple of weeks ago, which was actually the best attended town hall that we've ever had. We had over 260 participants, and we really look forward to the follow-up with this this committee and what they tend to bring to helping support diversity within our organization and diversity uh, uh, within the workforce and also in inclusion and in dealing with issues related to patient care. So we had the return of the athletic trainer bill. Uh, no surprise. We had actually 
Uh, that, and along with the Dynamex uh, court ruling in AB5, which dealt with independent contract relationships, and that dominated our legislative agenda. As the COVID pandemic took center stage, the ATC licensure bill and uh, separate title protection bill were actually removed from the agenda, and they tend to focus on those items that really had uh, urgency in, in terms of, of the pandemic and everything else is basically tabled. So imagine this coming year, we're going to have a very packed agenda of legislative issues. We worked on the restrictions imposed by this AB5 Dynamics issue in the original Dynamics court case. Uh, although we, we've made some headway and had some partial victories, we, we still need to have a lot of work to do to ensure that physical therapists and physical therapist assistants have full control of the determination of the business relationships that they want to enter into. We don't have that in this bill yet. Uh, so we have work to do. So stay tuned for uh, an upcoming webinar we are going to have to inform members how they can work through the existing regulations that uh, and, and statutes that have been developed uh, out, of the, uh, out of the legislation this year and out of AB5. Um, we also continued with uh, uh, legislation, as I mentioned earlier, on the PT Interstate Licensure Compact. We failed in our attempts this year, but we felt we laid a fairly good foundation for bringing that issue forward uh, in, in future years. And we also coordinated with a separate group that is trying to authorize the provision of animal uh, rehab under um, our licensure. So what's been the impact on, on our members through all of this? And a, a few slides here, and these come from um, the uh, APTA survey that was done um, in July. And as you can see, the PT work hours were really impacted most in the home health setting and the outpatient office or group practice. We performed our own survey, which had to do with that workforce um, readiness that I mentioned earlier. And we actually had 2,500 respondents to that survey. We didn't survey all the same things APTA did because it was a different intent to that survey. But that survey actually showed that 75% of the respondents in California had experienced a reduction in work hours. And more specifically, 83% of those in outpatient had experienced reduced work hours during the pandemic. Loss of income was really felt uh, much stronger by the PT assistant community and especially, especially in the skilled nursing and home health. And that was followed by PTs in the outpatient setting. By the way, this entire survey is available on the APTA website. If you wanna go in and look under their um, COVID-19 area, you're gonna see the, the survey with, with everything in there. You can take some time to study it. And there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff on this slide, and this one actually is specific to California. And what it's showing in summary is that 16% of the PTs in California were furloughed, and 7% of them lost their jobs, while 26% of PTAs were furloughed, 15% lost their jobs. And remember, this is a survey of members who responded, so um, it is not representative of the, the total workforce in California. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the future. And we are planning to do different surveys as we move along to, to really tap in what the impact of all this has been on our membership and how we can best respond. We also realize that there are many part-time PTs who are caring for school-aged children and at home and are unable to really return to positions that they previously had and are challenged by the, their ability to, to balance a return to work with demands at home. Um, anecdotally and through other mechanisms, we are seeing uh, a rebound in outpatient environment to about 80 to 90 percent of, of pre-COVID levels with a number of restrictions being imposed just by the physical space requirements and social distancing that has to occur in the workplace. One of the, the outcomes that really occurred here that I think hasn't been integrated into our practice has really been in the area of telehealth. The, the pandemic has definitely raised the importance of telehealth as a viable form of care delivery. The adaptability of our profession when, when placed in a crisis mode is really quite remarkable. I mean, we are working hard to instill this delivery method, method as a permanently payable service among all payer types. You know, there's a national effort at the Medicare level and we continue at a local level with our local payers to try to have them make sure that they cover this telehealth 
beyond the, the, the pandemic. I mentioned uh, you know, how important members are here, and this is a, a, a snapshot of what happened with our own membership during this pande pandemic. And membership drop was fairly significant in April, May, and June. Uh, these are month over month comparisons in 29, over 2019. So we didn't lose 42% of our members in April, but the, the membership renewal in April was 42% um, less than APTA and 43% for CPTA compared to April 2019. APT did institute a 90 day grace period for anyone reviewing through the end of September. So we are really not gonna be able to see how those numbers play out until the end of the year or even the beginning of next year. However, looking at our actual year to date membership renewals, we are only down 1% on membership. That's not dues, but that's membership overall with a 2% deficit just primarily in the physical therapist active member category. I can tell you that we have prepared ourselves for this drop from a financial standpoint. We are in a good place. We have set aside money. We have had to dip into reserves. We have had to make adjustments in, in, in staffing and expenses. Uh, but the chapter has been very active with a, with a very active finance committee, finance officer and board and staff and doing what they can to adapt to this. Uh, we did see a good sign in August with a bump up in, in the membership, and we hope that will continue through the rest of the year. And I can't emphasize how important it is to, to maintain the membership, to maintain the level of services that we have. We have so many moving parts uh, that we're faced with, and we, I hope you realize how important CPTA and APTA has been in helping our members get through this pandemic, which is really uh, probably thousands of calls have come in. To, for assistance in various areas, and um, your, your staff and your board has done a fantastic job. job. And I also wanna thank uh, the volunteers on committees, task forces, and the districts. Uh, you have all stepped up and interacted and responded to the, the needs of our members. Oops, wrong way. So now I'm asking for your help on something extremely important. We have a proposed fee schedule cut of 9% coming up in Medicare, and the danger of that could be extended to private payers who utilize the Medicare fee schedule. And there has been a, a shout out or reach out to you through the APTA. If you look at your inbox from two days ago, you're going to see connected connections to uh, your legislators to write letters. It is not hard to do. They have, they have really facilitated the way that that occurs. And I urge you to do that. We're looking for 30,000 letters and we're not there. We need to make this impact. We also have a, another mechanism that we're, we're going after here with HR 7154. So this is federal legislation. And this actually has other things in it. It is, it is to make the, the payment for telehealth permanent under Medicare. It is also to try to remove the requirement to have a signed plan of care in order to authorize uh, care under the Medicare program. I know that's been in, in uh, impediment to us uh, in terms of our continuity of care and it's to, to stop the proposed 9% cut. We are also tackling this from a couple other ways to try to get just a suspension for a year on the, on the cuts and also in a coalition with other professions uh, to try to um, offset the, the, this reduction. So we are working very, very hard, but this is one of those issues where we need you, uh, anybody in your offices that you work with and your patients to write letters. So I also wanna highlight some good stuff this year. I'm actually sitting here in the chapter office with some plaques behind me, which are the names of people, past recipients of different awards. And normally we would recognize these individuals during our face-to-face -face conference, but we don't have the ability to do it this year. And we want to do this and recognize these folks next year. But I don't wanna go without recognizing the, the individuals who really have stepped up in your association over the years. And, with the Royce P. Nolan Award Emeritus, uh, Dr. Cheryl Resnick, the James McKillop Leadership Awards, Dr. Terry Nordstrom, the Charles Magistro Award is Randy Gee and James Piccini, and the Clarence Healthgren CPTA Service Award it goes to five people, to Tom DeFranco, Barbara Edmondson, Dr. Don James, Dr. Stephanie Kaplan, and, and Robert Williams. And I have actually had the honor and pleasure to know every one of the, the people who these awards are named for. And it is an extreme honor to, to uh, have your name associated with them. So uh, a virtual applause to all of these folks. We also have a Rising Star Award, which is those individuals who really kind of were tapping and say, you guys are on your way 
to being stars in our association and your, your volunteer roles. And this is Dr. Christina Del Carmen, Dr. Um, Haddon and, and Dr. Mankata and Samantha Strike. So I wanna recognize them along with their publication awards to Joseph Darian and Pamela Mickelson. Thank you very much. And you will be recognized much more formally next year. And also I've got a few board members who are leaving and these, these are, are performers that have done such a fantastic uh, job this year in so many areas. Val Tegley, our vice president, Chukwemeka Whitway as our director and Kelly Kubota and, and their areas of expertise on leadership in the assembly, on education, on membership services, and on diversity affairs have really required a lot of efforts on their parts this year. And as board members, I, I wish I can be working with these people indefinitely during, during my term. So uh, the greatest reward for, for doing is the opportunity to do more. And that's what we expect out of our volunteers because as you start volunteering, we want you to do more. And none of this could have occurred without the efforts of a, just a fantastic chapter staff. We are one of those fortunate components in the entire country to have full-time staff, to have staff that supports you, supports the board. And they have adapted to, to the demands this year like, like no other time in history with staggering schedules, working from home, uh, trying to handle uh, member calls, shifting this entire conference to a virtual event, shifting our assembly, assembly representatives to a virtual event. And to Rita Pearson, who has actually created uh, Wednesdays with Rita pretty much because she's conducted a webinar almost every Wednesday. So we have added services to our members and uh, we, I really want to thank them for everything. And this is, this is a statement that I was reminded of this week from a former student of mine. And I, 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 had, a, I had this quote from a commencement speech that I did back to the Cal State Northridge PT graduating class in 1986. And as your president, I, I wanna be the person who's interested in you and the profession. I, I don't wanna be the person who is, uh, the, who is the personality, who is the person that you think is interesting. It's more important to be interested in others than to be the person who's interesting. And we gain more from listening and, and learning from others than we really gain from expounding on our own beliefs in an effort to attract attention. So. That means that I wanna remain open as your president, accessible and, and responsive. And as a profession, we have some things that we need to do. It's a following the golden rule on how, how we treat others and to treat others as we wanna be treated ourselves and recognizing the accomplishments of others. We can't do it with hugs and handshakes right now. We can do it with words. So uh, use words to express your, your thanks and gratitude to others. And, and we're gaining a lot of knowledge through this pandemic. And I know that that's gonna actually better our profession in the end, and we're gonna use that. And you're gonna hear some insight in that during conference. Be a part of the community and elevate the importance of PT to others. Take the opportunity to mentor others and take small steps in helping us achieve our goals. So I want you to have a fantastic conference. Uh, there's some great content here, great speakers, a different format. And this is kind of time for us to reflect and reset for the, the, coming, the coming period. And I'm available through email for comments, uh, anything I said here, more questions, uh, and feel free to reach out to me. And so, Jimmy, uh, I'll turn it back to you and, and thank you everybody for your time this morning. Thank you so much, uh, Rick. Thanks for your remark, as well as the leadership from yourself and uh, your team. I I'd love to reiterate R Rick's remarks about setting messages to CMS about your feelings on a 9% cut. Uh, APTA is a great resource there at APTA.org. It took me less than 60 seconds. Even I could figure it out in less than 60 seconds how to send that all the way there. There's a link to that uh, resource from APTA in the chat discussion right now that Os Oscar Gaudo was nice enough to share uh, below. Continuing with our programming today, our next speaker is president of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation. She serves as chief executive officer of the foundation and is responsible for advancing the foundation's mission to improve health by accelerating support for medical research through recognition of research excellence, advocacy, and education. As an expert in infectious diseases, she is a longtime advocate for patients, especially those with HIV AIDS and public health. She passionately supports ongoing investment in the full range of research. She has a special interest in healthcare policy with a focus on the importance of the social determinants of health. She's published more than 100 articles and book chapters and edited three books. She serves on the Board of Trustees for the Morehouse School of Medicine and the Board of Directors for the Science Philanthropy Alliance, the Sierra Health Foundation, the Foundation for Biomedical Research, 
iBiology Incorporated, New York Academy of Medicine, Center for Women in Academic Medicine and Science, Haymonics Corporation, and Becton Dickinson and Company. That's a lot. She was inducted to the National Academy of Medicine in 2011. She received an honorary Doctor of Science degree from the University of Massachusetts in 2016. And she received her bachelor's in medical degrees from the University of Michigan and completed a residency and fellowship training in internal medicine and infectious disease at the University of Minnesota. She earned an MBA from the University of Kentucky and has held faculty positions at the University of Minnesota, the University of Kentucky, and the University of California, Davis. She was Chief Infectious Diseases and Associate Dean for Research and Informatics at the University of Kentucky and joined UC Davis in 2003 as Executive Associate Dean and served as Vice Chancellor and Dean of the School of Medicine from 2005 to 2013. Busy. Let's bring her into right here. The title of today's keynote is Creating a Healthier World by Addressing the Social Determinants of Health. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Claire Pomeroy. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the warm welcome that I've received from absolutely everyone so far. My talk today is a call to action, uh, a call to ask you to be part of the work to create a healthier world by addressing the social determinants of health. As you well know, every patient brings their life story when they come for care. Imagine this young girl. After years in foster care, she's aged out of the system and at 17 is living on her own, trying to finish high school, holding down a minimum wage job, and one day her asthma flares up. There's no one to make her hot soup or go to the store to buy decongestants and no one to know if she gets worse and can't even breathe at all. So she gets on a bus with two transfers to go to the emergency room where they give her a prescription for an inhaler that she can't afford. So of course, I don't need to imagine because that girl was me. And what I really needed was a ride home, some healthy food, and enough money to pay the bills when I missed work. You know, those clinicians followed all the clinical care standards, but they didn't give me what I really needed, social support that would ensure first my survival and then my well-being. And that was the day that I learned this message. We don't truly heal our patients until we address their life circumstances, all the aspects of how they live, work, and age. That is the social determinants of health. Now, we've seen this play out in the harsh realities of the current pandemic. People of color, for example, are disproportionately developing illness, requiring hospitalization, and dying every day. In large part, as highlighted on this slide from the CDC, due to social factors, including socioeconomic status, access to healthcare, and increased exposure due to things like crowded living conditions, reliance on public transportation, and working at frontline jobs. Indeed, the social determinants dramatically impact COVID-19 risk, with the likelihood of dying 4.5 times higher for those experiencing housing challenges, and 3.4 times higher among the unemployed. So COVID-19 is, is in itself a call to action, a clarion call to, to build back better, a clarion call to attenuate all of these health inequities. So you know, because you see this every day in your practices, we all know the realities. In the United States, we spend more per capita than any other developed country on healthcare. And yet we rank among the worst of developed nations on indicators ranging from infant mortality 
to life expectancy. And, and our country is characterized by shameful health disparities. Disparities on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, education, immigration status, incarceration history, and socioeconomic class. This is the reality. In our country today, African American babies are more than twice as likely as white babies to die. African American adults live on average six years less than whites. And in the USA today, income directly and continuously correlates with life expectancy such that it differ, differs up to 20 years between the re richest and poorest. 20 years. And in my own city of New York, life expectancy is over eight years lower in Harlem, which is just a few subway stops away from my privileged Upper East Side neighborhood. As we struggle with how to safely open schools and universities in this pandemic, we also must not forget that health is dramatically linked to educational opportunity. The life expectancy gap between those without a high school degree and those who finish college is nearly 11 years. And that is predicted to grow so that by 2030, the gap will widen further to more than 16 years. And you, as physical therapists, you, you see this as you care for your patients. Think about the fact that education level directly correlates with the likelihood of meeting desired aerobic physical activity levels, ranging from a low of less than 10% for those who didn't finish high school to more than three times that for those with advanced degrees. And this then manifests in two disturbing trends, the rising levels of obesity and increasing rates of arthritis among our patients. And these trends are disproportionately impacting people in different geographies and different socioeconomic class. Martin Luther King said nearly five decades ago, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And it has been pointed out that it is the unequal distribution of money, power, and resources that creates health disparities. We will not correct these health disparities until we address that unequal distribution of money, power, and resources. You know, I believe that Martin Luther King's words ring with increasing urgency today. We see it in the pandemic. And we understand that in our country today, one's zip code is a more powerful driver of health status than one's genetics code. Social factors account for one third of all US deaths. We have spent a lot of money deciphering genetic codes. It is time for us to invest in changing the reality that zip code is a more powerful driver of health status than your genetic code. And further, I believe that we need to re-envision our health care system, re-envision it with a focus on health equity. We need to move from a sick care system to a well care system. We need to move from a system that is reactive to one that is proactive, from one that focuses on disease and also, but also embraces prevention and primary care. We have to move from a hospital provider-centric system and adopt a population focus. Fundamentally, 
We must move from a traditional medical model to one that also addresses the social determinants of health. Well, of course, continuously perfecting our downstream clinical care interventions, we must also move upstream to address the socioeconomic, the legal, the political, the social network drivers of health. It has been correctly said that perfecting healthcare, the clinical part, that's a half answer if the living conditions that cause the disease prevail. Indeed, we now know that what many of us spend long hours working on, and thank you for doing that, optimizing our clinical care delivery system, that determines only a small fraction, about 10% of health status in our country. Indeed, social determinants, things like education, poverty reduction, access to healthy foods, safe neighborhoods, these are much more powerful drivers of health. And we need to go beyond that and recognize that things like social cohesion are increasingly important as drivers of health. In fact, the importance of the social determinants has manifested as another epidemic, an epidemic called the deaths of despair. These are deaths due to accelerating substance abuse and suicides among white men. And in our increasingly polarized world, the health consequences of fraying social cohesion, of loneliness, of a loss of sense of belonging are exerting an incredibly painful toll. In fact, it was recently pointed out that loneliness causes as many deaths as cigarette smoking in our country today. And further, as our society grapples with a legacy of racial injustice, we now understand that America's policies on criminal justice also impact health. Incarceration is a social determinant of health. And in the United States, we jail more people by far than every other industrialized country. And this too, disproportionately affects people of color. Black men are six times as likely as whites to be incarcerated. And nearly one out of three black men will be jailed in their lifetime. We hear these calls for people to take responsibility for their own health. And yes, people must make good health decisions, but they must have good decisions to make. Addressing social determinants of health is how we give them that opportunity to make good decisions. Think about the mother raising her children in a dangerous neighborhood. She might be critiqued for allowing her overweight son to watch TV all day, but she is making a logical decision to forego outdoor play when she knows there is a very real risk he will be shot by gangs. Now, when I talk about these issues, many people say, Great, 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 but healthcare is too expensive already. There's no way we as clinicians can take on all these additional problems. There's no way that we as a nation can take on all these problems. The truth is, it is not a question of spending more money. It's how we spend our money. This graph shows spending by developed countries as a percent of GDP for clinical care in the light blue, and for social services in the dark blue. If you look at the red arrow, you can see 
that total U.S. spending on these downstream and upstream health issues, total U.S. spending falls near the middle. But we are an outlier in that we spend our money downstream on clinical care in the light blue and much less on the upstream social services which address the social determinants of health that drive health status. So as shown on this slide, overall, compared to other industrialized nations, the US spends less on social services, but more on clinical care, though the total remains comparable. So we can afford to address the social determinants of health. We can afford to move towards health equity. Moving towards health equity means that we must implement systems that sustain a social determinants approach. As Sir Michael Marmot has said, and he's really the, the sort of grandfather of social determinants, he said, we understand the key drivers of health inequities. We understand the drivers of health at the social and political level. Now, now we must act on them, which as I said at the top of this talk, is why this is a call to action. Now, these are not new insights. Since 2014, the National Academies have issued at least five reports on social determinants, concluding that, quote, as a determinant of health, medical care is insufficient for ensuring better health outcomes, end quote. I urge you all to read those reports. But reports, reading reports, those won't change things. It calls for action. And the good news is that we are starting to find solutions. The effectiveness of addressing upstream drivers of health has been shown repeatedly already. For example, this concept of social prescribing. Social prescribing has been utilized to address food insecurity. You actually write a prescription for food. This has been linked to improved diabetic control and even to avoiding nursing home admissions among the elderly. Think of Meals on Wheels and think about if that was available to every kid in poverty, every homeless adult. Investing in housing for the homeless can actually save health systems money with decreases in total costs and improved outcomes, as shown actually by many, many different um, organizations from the Camden Coalition to Bon Secours. And one of my favorite initiatives is um, actually been tried both in the Bronx and in, in, in Cincinnati where they have brought together non-traditional partners from city planners to housing inspectors to school officials as well as health leaders to rectify substandard housing units and shown that they can get a reduction in childhood asthma ER visits and reduce school absences. And interventions by health leaders can also take place at the community level. I think we were all inspired by the work in Flint of a dedicated physician to shine light on the risks of lead in the drinking water and, and her call for elected representatives to change city policies. We can all be voices of advocacy as health providers, we are respected voices in the community. And you know, these environmental issues are not just isolated to poor communities. Air pollution levels have been clearly correlated with all cause mortality, cardiovascular deaths, and respiratory illnesses. 
Young people are calling on us all to address climate change. We can be part of that solution. So how do we actually affect these changes in our own communities, in our own practices? This isn't a job that clinical providers can or should take on alone. It requires intersectoral collaboration, partnering with those who work in sectors from education to criminal justice to urban planning and more. And today I'd like to talk about the fact that the solutions can come from at least three areas, policy changes, changes in reimbursement, and advances in linking clinical care and technology. First, policy changes. A health in all policies approach calls on policymakers at all levels, both in government and in private organizations, and by the way, in our own healthcare systems, to consider the health implications of every policy. It has been pointed out by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that this is an approach at its core of addressing the social determinants of health. Just think, for example, about corn and high fructose products, which have been linked to obesity, and the irony of the fact that one government office provides these farm subsidies, well, maybe even just down the hall, another pays for an anti-obesity anti program. The ability of policy interventions to make a difference is clear. Take, for example, taxes on sugared beverages. When passed in Philadelphia, there was a dramatic reduction in consumption, and the tax revenues were used to help support social determinant interventions, things like pre-K education, investment in green spaces and parks, Similar results have been gotten in seven other cities, at least, that have tried this. Indeed, a recent article in JAMA discussed the potential power of legal interventions from banning hazardous products to, yes, gun control, to minimum wage legislation. All of these things are legal interventions that can improve health. Now, none of this is easy. First of all, intersectoral collaboration is not easy, but there are real reimbursement problems. Because of the social determinants of health, the vulnerable are more expensive to care for, especially in the short run until we change their life circumstances. And we remain faced with the wrong pocket phenomenon. Providers are usually pay, paid from the clinical care budget silo, and the sectors responsible for social services are paid from a different budget. We remain faced with the pressures to achieve financial mar margins in our health systems, often on a short-term quarterly basis. And that short-term horizon precludes often upstream investments in the social determinants of health because they will take longer time frames to achieve measurable benefits. Just think about the fact that um, if you're responsible for a hospital budget, you know that the immediate return on investment for another PET scanner will be far greater than the delayed return on investment from investing in, say, a nutrition counseling program to address childhood obesity. So we must alter our clinical reimbursement systems, and I've heard you doing some of that advocacy in the first talk. We must alter our clinical reimbursement systems so that they incentivize a more upstream approach to care, like the Medicaid waivers in several states, including California, and initiatives such as the Funders Forum on Accountable Health, which is a public-private collaborative that encourages social determinant solutions. And as you may know, in the broadest trial to date of this approach, CMS 
now supports accountable health communities programs that allow Medicare dollars to be used for things like housing, transportation, and other social services. That is investing in the social determinants of health. Unfortunately, these reimbursement challenges are further exacerbated by the paucity of clinical care innovations and technology solutions to address social determinants. Many professional societies now call for screening for social determinants, but the tools are not routinely available to many. And many of our EMRs hold little information on social determinants or on social service resources available in our communities. Today, I'd like to emphasize that such tools are increasingly available and some can even be downloaded from the internet. Others are supported by experienced companies that specialize in advising. Six are listed here from a recent report. For example, at Boston Medical Center, an EMR tool was used to screen for issues such as housing needs, food insecurity, and a community resource directory was created in their EMR. At the OCHIN system of primary care clinics, a prepare based tool is used for screening and a list of referral resources is available in the EMR. And importantly, to support the Accountable Health Communities programs, a social needs screening tool is now available from CMS. It has questions on housing, food, transportation, utility needs, and personal safety. And further, it is essential that we understand the effectiveness of screening for social needs and our ability to link them to community resources. At Houston's Patient Care Intervention Center, their Unified Care Continuum platform connects data from clinical sites, government agencies, and social programs. And they've been able to show preliminary evidence of lowered costs and improved outcomes. I hope every health system does this kind of research and assessment. A current example of linking is a recent initiative undertaken to address the current crisis of COVID-19. This is actually a California example. Recognizing the need to address social determinants in disproportionately impacted communities, a philanthropic organization has partnered with government to provide wraparound services in selected high-risk communities, including things like testing, emergency housing and transportation, food security, and employment assistance. A key to the success of this particular program is the empowerment of diverse health teams. Clinicians are best positioned to address patients' life circumstances if they have lived those circumstances themselves and thus create interpersonal and cultural trust. Diverse teams are essential to accomplishing the goals of health equity. As documented by Scott Page and many others, quote, diversity trumps ability. Groups perform better when they are diverse. Many of us know the pain of unconscious bias, such as Dr. Cross experienced when she volunteered to assist with an in-air medical emergency and was told to, quote, put your hand down. We're looking for actual positions. We should all look in the mirror as we choose our teams. As a physician, I know that the racial makeup of physicians in the US lags far be behind the demographics of the total population. And I see women dropping out of professional leadership roles a problem recently documented, by the way, to be exacerbated by the pandemic. And I see that the medical students who will be the future providers disproportionately come from the highest quintiles of family income. So I am so pleased that um, 
The workforce for physical therapists is uh, more diverse than these numbers. I'm so pleased that you have a diversity initiative in your own organization. And I hope that we can all continue to work toward the day that all clinicians look like the patients we serve. So in conclusion, diverse teams will be key to adopting a social determinants framework that facilitates healthcare moving beyond equality when everyone gets the same thing, as in this well-known depiction in which every kid gets one box, but the short one still can't see the ball game. And though you can't see me on um, standing up, I have great empathy for that short kid. Um, we need to move from that equality where every kid gets one box to equity, in which everyone gets what they need. The short kid gets more boxes. Therefore, everyone can see the game. And for healthcare, that means everyone can have an equal opportunity for as healthy a life as possible. And we can extend this to understand that we have to look beyond the individual's patient's physical condition to address their life circumstances. You know, are they standing on low ground or were they fortunate to have been born on a hill? These social realities impact their ability to see the field and in healthcare, their ability to achieve good health. And if we embrace our responsibility to partner with other sectors to change social policies and economic realities, we can go further and remove social barriers. We can replace that wood fence with one that you can see through, and it might even cost less, allowing everyone to have a full view of the game. And we can even imagine a world in which every child is included in the game and truly has a full chance for a healthy life. We need to change because it is the right thing to do and because it is the smart thing to do. We need to achieve health equity. We need to address social determinants in order to improve outcomes, reduce disparities, and ultimately lower costs. Only then will we be able to meet the needs of all those who have come to us for help. Only then will we be able to provide the care that every patient needs. And only then will the vulnerable, like the foster kid I was, receive what they need to heal and thrive. There is much to be done. There is far to go. As Martin Luther King also said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And yet it does not bend on its own. It bends only when good people come together to define a better reality, to accelerate that bend towards justice. I believe that together as healthcare leaders, we can do it. We can define a more equitable healthcare system. We can address social determinants of health. Thank you for listening. It has been an honor to talk with you. Let's join in some virtual applause in that chat for Dr. Pomeroy. Dr. Pomeroy, thank you for sharing your remarks and insights, uh, focusing on really the strategies improving the societal health with us today, large focus on upstream solutions in our system. So thank you so much for your time. We appreciate that. It's been great. And um, I would uh, like to actually segue into asking people to participate in the polls. Um, so um, maybe Rita, we can go to the back to the um, uh, 
first one. It's up on the uh, uh, screen under polls, I believe. And the question is, in your current job, do you have access to a tool to screen for social determinants of health? Wow. And thank you to everyone who answered. And this kind of um, it shares the message, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, it's fascinating to me to learn from you about how many of you have access to this. 42% um, of you said, no, screening for social determinants isn't part of our practice. Uh, Dr. Uh, Pomeroy, is, is, this, yeah. is this consistent with what you see in other situations? Yes, yes, it is. I mean, the good news is it's starting to change. Um, but um, I think that there are many, many healthcare settings where we are not um, yet screening for social determinants. And in fact, as shown in this survey, um, you know, we all got taught in when we went through our training how to take a social history. And that, you know, um, we've got, you know, a third of the people who are doing that um, as part of taking a social history. Great. Thank you for doing that. Um, but that's not standardized. And that's not in our EMRs. And it doesn't allow us to link directly to say a, a list of, of resources that we could refer people to. So hopefully what I want to do is, um, uh, if we can just go back to, um, oh well, yeah, go ahead and start voting on the second one. What I wanna do is move the answers from that, no, we don't have any tools to yes, it's on my back to uh, we have a paper tool to we have an electronic tool. So, Let's move to the second question, because the first one was like so interesting. Right. Um, and, and so you're voting now, and what a great audience, because you vote quickly. We thank you. Um, and in your current job, do you have access to lists of social programs to which you can refer patients experiencing challenges with the social determinants? And I think we're already starting to get- There's a trend there. A, a, a pretty clear picture of wow. what's going on here. Um, and, you know, I probably should have asked a poll of, do you want this? Um, I'm hoping that after my talk, more of you want it. Um, but uh, we can see a gap here um, with, with um, you know, I know that you as physical therapists are, are encountering patients who, you know, who are struggling because of these issues. And, and we need infrastructure to help you um, do this job better. So uh, pretty, pretty interesting findings. Dr. Pomeroy, where does this start? Where, where, where can we get this? Is this having conversations with those in leadership to get this involved in our EMRs to make sure it is in the discussion officially? Yeah, so um, I, I do think that the best way is to get this standardized into the clinic or the hospital or the health system in which you work. And, and so I, if everyone on this call, um, you know, raises their voice and asks for it. Um, but, but a lot of time, healthcare administrators don't know where to start, sure. uh, which is why I hope you take those slides that I showed of, of the downloadable apps. But listen, if, if the leadership isn't listening, you can download you know, those, those tools from the internet yourself. It's not as ideal as having it incorporated into, you, say, an EMR, um, but at least you, you can have those prompts available to you. So I, I urge people to do it on an individual basis and then speak up and so got, uh, in got, their team meetings advocate for this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got two more poll questions. We do want to encourage the audience right now would be a, a, a good time if you'd like to turn your camera on, turn your microphone on to ask any questions. Uh, are we going to go to question number three? And yeah, we're active right there in the third poll question. Have you personally been involved in health policy advocacy? Wow. So I asked this question because, um, you know, you all are so respected by your patients. Um, you are respected in the community as having an authoritative voice about health. And if we are going to change our healthcare system, um, your voices are absolutely needed. Um, so so I, 
I would love, and, and maybe we'll act, ask Rick Katz if, if maybe he would consider um, at the end of the year redoing this survey and see if we can bump up these numbers a little bit. Now, now, thank you to those of you who have advised government officials, those of you who have spoken to community groups as shown on this slide and, and, and spoken or, or intervened in, in other ways. Um, but go ahead and write those op-eds and let, maybe we could challenge ourselves to you know, increase these percentages um to uh really have have an impact and you know organizations such as this um you your organization represents a coalition of voices which is even more powerful and um i know that you um we heard about how you do advocacy and i would love to see um talking about social determinants uh included in in some of the advocacy um work that you do can I make a quick comment on that? Please. Um, I, I, I appreciate your comments, Claire. They're really, really timely. We had our assembly representatives meeting yesterday and there were a number of our um, motions that, that carried that dealt with uh, social determinants of health and, and diversity, equity, inclusion. And uh, I, the, we, we do have a, a committee that is, is really focused on that. And I like your suggestion as far as repeating the survey and including some of these items in that survey. So we were planning to do a survey on workforce and the pandemic, and this would just kind of tag along with that well. So I appreciate those comments and uh, that'll be something that we'll, we'll try to integrate with our, our survey uh, coming up. Great, and, thanks. And actually in fairness then, I guess everyone on this call could have said yes, because they're members of this organization that's been doing advocacy. Uh, but the question was about you personally doing it. So thank you. Maybe we can go to the fourth and final uh, poll and um, get, get your answers to, in your professional role, have you personally experienced unconscious bias from colleagues or patients? And remember this was this was a question that really was part of the importance of having diverse teams. And uh, you know, most of you are, are practicing in California, which has a diverse population. And I know many of you practice on diverse teams, but um, this, these results are very consistent with what I hear in other settings, which is almost everybody um has experienced unconscious bias or seen unconscious bias now i didn't ask the poll question of have you found yourself practicing unconscious bias uh, against others because that's a self-reflection thing that i'm going to encourage you to do on your own but um probably most of you have gone through quote unconscious bias training we can you know have long conversations about how effective that is um but if you haven't you know if you haven't taken that test to see if you have unconscious bias um uh, i encourage you to do so it it is disconcerting when say as a woman you find out that you have unconscious bias towards women you know that um that that is uh disconcerting but it helps provide insight so with that um i just want to say i think these polls were fascinating um i i appreciate everybody participating and um i really wanted to spend some time to uh hear from you and to hopefully have a little bit of a q a session so that's what the last part of our um, hour is for. Sure. Uh, so right now, if you'd like to turn your camera microphone on and ask a question, you can. If you'd like to uh, ask a question in the chat, we can, uh, we can have the CPTA team kind of filter those through as well. We know, you're, uh, we know your thumbs are working because of the poll questions. Uh, answers were coming rather quickly. Jimmy, we have Ben Braxley. He's in Sacramento, and he's ready to ask a question. All right, Ben. Good morning, Dr. Pomeroy. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your passion. Um, really appreciate it. I, I've read a little bit about the social determinants of health, um, and I haven't found a way personally to implement it within my clinic yet, um, but you've given me some great ideas, and I really appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I was looking into as I read was the difference between um, zip codes and census tracts, and there was, there was some literature that said you should really 
try to get down to the census track level is that's that's more indicative is there a tool or a resource that you would recommend we look at or is zip code good enough um, as a starting point what would you recommend so um, I think from a, um, a research and policy point of view, census tracts are really, really important. I mean, they go to things like the, our, our legacy of redlining, which um, led to segregation, such that you get those realities of a few subway stops away. There are these stark differences in the health outcomes. But um, I would say that starting with zip code for um, at the practice level, as opposed to the research level, is, is a great place to start. And, and you know, that brings us to this question of, there is, there is this need to um, use these screening tools to identify vulnerable communities and, and, and do that on a policy level. Like, does your health system, can they identify some zip codes where they should be doing special programs, special health fairs, uh, having education programs, those kind of things, hypertension screening, whatever. And then there's screening at the individual level, right? Because you could be in a census tract or a zip code that you know looks like it's high so socioeconomic, but that's not your reality. Um, and you're having food insecurity. So um, oftentimes in a practice setting, it's that screening at the individual level that is particularly important. Now, I know that all of you, you know, try to be sens sensitive to that, but boy, here's the reality. You've got, you know, a 15 or 30 minute visit. There are lots of things to cover. It can be very hard to, uh, you know, get to a point where you're comfortable enough to ask like, you know, do you have enough food to eat or, are you experiencing personal violence in your home? Um, but, but these written screening tools that are often given out in advance, um, those are a way that people can sometimes feel more safe in providing you that kind of, of data. And the final thing I would say is, um, we have to understand that there are people who will not want to answer these things. They uh, might fear that they'll be used against them. For instance, if you disclose your immigration status, you know, you, we all are still sort of, you know, uh, uh, the bureaucracy and, and, and people don't completely trust, right? And so we have to respect that. Um, but I think that as you see people and develop relationships with them, you may get more and more of these answers on the individual level. So thank you for thinking about it, Ben. Any other questions? Use that uh, hand raise feature. And it looks like we have a couple right now. Uh, Cornelia, I believe, was up first. If you want to turn your camera on your microphone. Um, hello, and thank you so much. This was an amazing talk. Um, I wanted to ask about a, a sort of tangential but important subject, which is the whole question of illiteracy. I, I mean, I have experience with many public agencies, and I'm sure it's also true with private, that people don't, aren't able to read and that's not recognized. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Absolutely, uh, really important point, Cornelia. Thank you for highlighting it. Now we talked about education level, right? And the, and the link to health outcomes. Um, and we know that if a kid isn't, you know, reading at the third grade level by the third grade, that, that they are going to have a much tougher time in life, including their health outcomes. So that, but we also understand that we hand people a sheet of instructions often when they walk out of our clinic, right? If they can't read that, what, what are we thinking that that sheet of paper is going to do? So there is basic literacy and there is health literacy, right? And the basic literacy is can, can you read the, the, the English, um, I hope, that your institutions also have things in other languages to hand out to people, but can you read the basic words? Um, and, and then above and beyond that, you know, have, are you health literate so that you can understand the sometimes jargon that we use? I believe that one way to address this is the use of patient navigators. And I think patient navigators or promotorias or, or, you know, they have lots of different names um, are, are one way 
that we can help people navigate through our often impersonal systems. And, and just think, as you point out, Cornelia, of trying to figure out how to get healthy when you can't read the instructions, you can't read the pill bottle, you can't read the signs that tell you where the PT clinic is when you come in the front door of the hospital. I mean, these, these are realities that our patients are experiencing. I would love to see us drive upstream. I would love to see health systems, and some of them are. Cincinnati Children's is doing this. They have partnered with the schools to make sure that um, reading programs are available to high-risk kids in the catchment area that their hospital serves. I'd love to see that um, scaled up to more communities because ultimately that will prevent the problems that you're fearing because of the lack of literacy, um, uh, even though there is some immediate expense, the long-term payout will be great. Yeah, you highlighted uh, about, uh, several different ways that people might not be able to receive communication in the chat, Casey chiming in, something that she was made aware of this year. Some of the younger aides not taught cursive in school as a result in text and computer domination. At first, you'd think, well, who wouldn't be able to read that? Well, someone who wasn't yeah. taught it wouldn't be able to read it. Uh, ra use the raise hand feature to get on the queue to ask a question. Uh, Leslie is up next. Leslie, you feel free to turn your camera and your microphone up. Hi, uh, good morning, Dr. Palmer. Excellent and inspiring talk. Um, I heard you a couple years ago at UC Davis, so once again, inspiring. Um, I live in Sacramento, and I didn't know about the SACCOVID19collab.org, so I appreciate that uh, you bringing that to our attention. What is the best way if we want to collaborate? Where do we find these organizations? Are they in public health or the social services? How do we start to navigate those inter-organizational um, uh, programs? Yeah, so um, great question. And J Leslie, just for your information, uh, that program that I highlighted is through the Sierra Health Foundation. Um, so that's where you can go to find, that's a little bit of local info for, for the Sacramento folks. Um, so already, most of you are referring your patients to social, social services places. Say if you, you find out a patient's hungry, you send them to the local food bank you probably have a contact there. I would suggest that one place to start is to you know, volunteer at the food bank, learn the people there, and then you will find that as a healthcare worker, they will start asking you questions. And that will be your chance to connect and, and increase your role in those organizations. I find the community-based organizations are so hungry for healthcare uh, provider involvement. And that is, um, I think, the most logical entree into doing some of this work. The other place is city government, um, county government, state government. Now, it can be harder to get into those bureaucracies, but you all have representatives, city council members, uh, county supervisors, elected representatives in, in you know, the state Senate and state house that I would urge you to connect with. And they have staff who work on healthcare issues as, as I know you know, and you know, offer your services. Say, these are issues that are important to me. I want you to work on them, but I wanna work on them with you. And then the third way is to talk to the leadership of your clinic or hospital or healthcare system and, and you know, urge them to um, have a grand rounds on this issue or to include this on the agenda of your team meetings. Um, just by doing that, you're raising awareness and then perhaps you can bring up the issue of you know, what are our policies? What are our resources? Um, how are we as a system going to emulate some of those best practices that we've discussed in the past hour? Great response. Thanks so much uh, for that question, uh, Leslie. Uh, feel free to, to, to uh, ask one more. Looks like we're running out of time here. Uh, we are going to take a 15 minute break, but before we did that, we wanted to thank Dr. Pomeroy for giving us her time and her insight. So thank you very much for that.
Uh, short 15 minute break. When we do come back, three very powerful PT Ed Talks by some of your colleagues. The 15 minute break, feel free to stretch your legs. And if you visit the cafeteria today, all the food is free because it's your <laughs> kitchen. We'll be back. Thank, thank you very much, Jimmy. Thank you all for attending and thank you all for all the hard work that you do every day in taking care of our patients. Kudos to you.